Don't talk setting civil rights back a damn decade. And ivory put together in perfect cornery. This side of TikTok consists of black people marginalizing themselves for white affection. Please, sir, I want some more. What? And after subjecting myself to hours worth of coon content, I was just gonna make one coon cringe compilation and call it a day. Until I conducted some interviews that changed the trajectory of this video. I realized that I held some prejudice for interracial couples. And unfortunately, I'm not in the minority. So now, we have to use the N-word. You know what? I'm about to say it. Okay. Nuance! I talked to Turb, an Afro-Canadian that's been dating interracially for years. And this is how it went for Her auntie called me the N-word? And like no one reacted except me. And then I spoke to Cat Block, a black woman who got plenty of true tea from her days of dating interracially. My primary partner is Mexican and Palestinian. I date interracially, but I'm never thinking, ooh, I got me a white boy. But everything changed after I spoke to an interracial couple, Brie and Jay. It hasn't been a completely smooth road for, for me and us, I guess, as a couple. It has uh, not. There have um, been some things in terms of like uh, race and... Uh, uh, like politics that I have had to challenge you on before, and then you were like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you took the L, you, you yeah. held the L. Let's start at the start. I thought that this was patient zero. Boyfriend haul. So, this is the one that I have. I purchased this one. One thing that I love about this one is he can literally do anything, fix anything, and I mean, look at him. <laughs> But Brie put me on to something that was even worse. Did y'all see this thing on TikTok called the hashtag Massa Challenge? Oh, babe. Who you This is my Massa. This is a thing. This is a thing. At first, I thought this was one race play thing, right? And that sent me to some PTSD that I have for my race play gone wrong story. But before I expose one of the most embarrassing moments of my life, if you ain't know what race play is and you want to search it up, don't go googling raw. You need protection, and I use NordVPN. Being in the Bahamas means I can't watch HBO Max, I can't watch Hulu, and I can't watch Amazon. But as soon as I start using NordVPN, I was watching Westworld. What you see online is totally different from what I see online, what the maple leaves over in Canada see online, what the yank stems. Everything is different, and that means you're missing out on all kinds of content. Unlike them other VPNs, NordVPN is actually keep you protected when you on them shady sites. I know what y'all is be doing, you know, I figure y'all out. You know when you was going on them sites and you was getting them pop-ups saying hot singles in your area? I ain't like that. How you know that? How you know hot singles in my area? That's why you need NordVPN because these companies, they be spying on you more than the NSA. Go to nordvpn.com slash fmfl to get a two-year plan and four months for free. Risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, no kink shaming, right? But Lord, when the kink come knocking at my door, Unsolicitly, like a Jehovah Witness, I take a shoe. It was leg day. And you know I don't miss legs. And I noticed that this old man that must escaped the geriatric ward just lurking around the squat rock. Cause apparently I still look warm and friendly when I listen to Converge lifting 200 pounds on a Bulgarian split squat. Now this Iowa we talking about. So mentally, I gotta prepare my script. <laughs> no, I actually don't play football. <laughs> yes, I, I do know my father. But I was surprised when this old man asked me to put on a 45 plate on the bar. I say, let me find out that Horace Nebercracker is a leg god. <laughs> I go on down to the locker room to do my mandatory pump assessment. My him bros and gym bros know what's going on. And let me tell you something. You all know that annoying boy from Hey Arnold that has been sneaking up on Helga? was never crocker. What I'd give for legs like yours, sonny. I, I appreciated seeing you. Back in my day, I used to be a young bull just like you. You folks sure do inspire me. <laughs> Th thank you, senior. I appreciate that. You know, I hope that I am in shape like you when I get your age. You sure are a stand-up fella. What are you doing for supper? Ah, you, you mean dinner? I actually fast at night. Ah, oh, shucks. Well... Let me get your tens, and I'll give you a ring for brunch sometime. Now you know your boy foreign. You know I come from a place where ancestral veneration is very important. I ain't gonna tell this old man to take a rusty biscuit back to the old folks' home. That ain't me. 
gonna take his number and I'm never gonna reply to him. But I guess that's my fault. Cause I gave this man the impression that I had the intention of going to brunch with him when I would rather pry a chew toy from Clifford the damn red dog. So I go on back to the dorm room ready to bury my face in this pillow and then my phone ring. And guess who it is? Never crock up. Leave me alone. You don't know I ain't answering that. But as soon as the phone stopped ringing, the texts start coming. And taking into account the time of night and the frequency of the text, I knew that this was some horny text. Never Crocker say, I hope this isn't too forward, but me and the missus would love to host you for an evening of fun. I was in denial. I ain't gonna lie, I, I was hoping that this boy was talking about a bingo night. Then I get one notification, right? One attachment for my message. Oh Jesus. From the thumbnail alone, I knew what was going on. The curiosity was killing me. So I had to open it up. It was a video. I click on this video, right? This boy, I assume this is wife. Man, this girl getting excavated like Minecraft by one obsidian skin black man. But what I was most taken aback by was that Grams had yams. Like far too much to function. An uncomfortable amount of yams. I ain't gonna lie, I have to unpack that in therapy. Anyway, whoever was filming was inside the closet. Like not metaphorically, literally inside the closet. I could see the hangers. And to make matters worse, Lord, this boy tilt the phone down. And all I see is this boy shaking his off like he trying to go and light one fire. I never block a number so quick in my 19 years at the time. This was my unfortunate introduction to cuckoldry. And I wish that it was the last, but this was just the first time that I got this proposal. If you've watched this TikTok or FD's video on objectifying black men, then you, you know that this is a Tuesday. My views on race play have transformed. I don't think that there's a problem with it so long as it's between consenting adults. Sexual exploration is something that I firmly believe in. But to the point that it does not encroach on another person's liberty. And unfortunately, in these dynamics, it's the person of color that totes the Lord. Hold on, I don't like how that sound. But the fact that Never Crocker was comfortable enough to come to me, a strange big black man with a beard that he don't know from Tyrone Flickin' Woodley. Not telling me that he is a veteran cop. He's like the Epstein of cocks. And guess what? That's where the line between sexual exploration and exploitation is trampled over, sauntered over, like flicking sea biscuit. And I can take the pasties to task all day. I mean, that's what my YouTube channel is all about. But I am more interested in the mindset and the perspectives of the black folks that are subjugated in these cases. A lot of the times, consentingly, in the boyfriend hall, the black man is literally being commodified by this blonde woman. That's the stick. That's what's supposed to be funny. And I can imagine if this was outrage bait. And I mean, if it is, it works, because I hear yapping about it. But regardless of it being bait or not, the dangers are still real. All I could think about was why would a black man willingly consent to being commodified? When he knows the history of him being commodified. But Turb's take on this was extremely illuminating, being a black man in an interracial relationship before. These instances of racism don't matter under the gaze of love. Just like when you're so close to the camera that you can't make out the details of my face, it's the same issue when you're so close to your partner that you can't make out the flaws in the relationship. Does the black man on this TikTok even know that he's being maligned? Or does he brush it off and claim that it's just a joke and say that the people making noise about it are actually just snowflakes? It's giving Tom from the boondocks. But like Turb said that it's love that makes you see past it, what about those arrangements that don't involve love? What is the appeal to black folks of this type of race play outside the context of love of someone that you know isn't taking advantage of you i do think a lot of black men are into that that degree of racial fetishism and i think a big part of it is because for a lot of black men whether this person is racist or not or is repulsed by you or not either way they get to fuck like a classic stereotype about black men is that they are just 
always horny, sexually aggressive, into almost anything, da 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 da. And that's part of the whole BBC Mandingo shit, right? And for a lot of black men, especially black men who exist in predominantly non black spaces or spend a lot of time in those spaces, they kind of experience a little bit of like social rejection because they are black men. And so sometimes you have someone who's turning to you and saying, you know what, you got that BBC, that's what I'm interested in. And it feels affirming the situation where you otherwise experienced rejection. Over 20% of black men, 22 to 64, are poor. As are some 28% of black men over 65 in the United States. That means that not many black men are able to perform patriarchy financially. This manifests in courtship and partnership practices, like taking someone out on a date, or buying them a gift as romance. I want to pay for this, I want to pay for that. I want to pay for the meals, I want to do this, just to kind of surmount that wage gap. There's also the social stratification dynamic at play, where historically, black men have been shown as inferior in comparison to white men. Thus, the systemic obstacles in the way of black men trying to redeem themselves in the dating field end up being extremely limited. One way that we've been able to excel has been artistically, sexually, and athletically, which are typically tethered together. And we've historically excelled in these arenas so much that it has become a roadmap for black men to patriarchy, to the point where our parents would groom us to be adept in these arenas simply for survival. Ergo, we eternalize that, and that turns into black fetishization. Sometimes black men like to be fetishized, and that's not inherently a bad thing because it reinforces their masculinity that's one of the driving factors of society that like black men can like consistently go to which reinforces their masculinity the black the black masculine aspect is there anything inherently wrong with someone trying to affirm their gender because i'd be lying if i told you i only work out and fight for health reasons one of the reasons i like being athletic is because i like to be perceived as athletic but performing these gender binaries can and do many times go wrong. This boy is so giddy for patriarchy points that he is willing to look past the fetishization. He really sees him being groped as praise rather than predation. And maybe that would be fine behind closed doors, but not for a TikTok that is going to be broadcast to millions of people, which perpetuates a narrative that this is acceptable behavior for black men. It's basically saying, yeah, come grab me up, come feel me up, because that's the same attitude that breeds a never cracker. To my frosty, the snowmen folk them. Listen, I know you all is mean well when you're all trying to show you all appreciation for black people, right? But don't let, don't hop on that I love you black man trend. I love you black man. 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 Black man, I love you. There's this tendency for white liberals in particular to overcompensate for their biases and end up being extremely fetishy. When you come up to me and saying, oh, I love dark skins, your skin is so smooth. Listen, man, listen, I don't like that. I don't like that. Most of the white women here think that Winston is sexier. And even worse news for white men, they say that he's better in bed. So, is that why white women prefer black men? The skin. The skin? Oh, it's so lovely. Black skin against white skin. Oh, what do you mean skin? Nice. I've got lovely skin. No, not like black man's skin. Well, what's the difference with black men's skin? Like? Well, if they look after it, it's all soft. It's like chocolate. They're so physically gorgeous. But I can't also it's think... It's a physical thing. Black men are definitely better in bed. They treat you right, they take their time over you, where a white man won't. They're too quick to get there and get it over with. Now you can tell this video is a blast from the back of the bus, right? But things like this is still going on to this day. It's a very fine line between appreciating blackness and fetishizing blackness. And when your fetishism takes you to partnering up with a black person, things get ugly real quick but then she was following like all these interracial pages she was always sending me photos of like mixed babies she was like she was following the ace family like <laughs> no man yeah no man yeah well that was like my first relationship and i was very uh. i wasn't 
I wasn't really religious, but I did have religious trauma. So it was the first time I had with the girl, like the intercourse experience with the girl. And like, it was the first time I like really opened up with the girl. So imagine, Coitus, one of the most formative experiences of someone's life. And that being a product of racial fetishization. Imagine the subsequent experiences after that. Imagine one's sexual self after that. And that's just the dangers for black men. But we all know the brunt of these dangers are felt by black women. I think it's scarier for me than it is for a black man because when I think of someone racial fetishizing me, I'm thinking of, you know, the way that I have sex, which is, you know, I the receiver and, you know, yeah. and, and that's scary to me. It's really scary to me to be in a situation where I'm with someone who racially fetishizes me because I'm disempowered in that situation. Cuckoldy bullshit, right? Where there's a white couple who, you know, wants to get a big black man to go fuck the, the white wife and so then the white guy jerks off in the corner it's a whole thing even in that situation even though in a way the white couple is indeed dominating this black man yes this black man can kind of con convince himself that he's in a position of power he's in a position where he's sticking it to the, the white man literally and despite the tangible dangers the black women faced in these dynamics there's a very vocal minority. I vowed not to discuss them due to the misogynal war that runs rampant online and the fact that this space right here that you're in is a safe space for black women. But that's actually the reason why I feel as though this needs to be discussed. Hey, 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 hey. Stop. Stop. Ah, ah. Look, ladies. Ah, ah, ah. Let's go, bitch. Drop that ass. Shorty, get the bag. bag. Shorty, get the bag. Get the this ain't even satire uh, like i don't know how much or if she was paid for this but she wasn't paid enough a recent phenomena has been observed that has the black community up in arms and that is the notion that most of the desirable and eligible black men that are in the united states are dating and marrying outside of their race. The black men that I've been interested in and have pursued just magically can never make time to pursue me. But being able to make a lot of time for white partners, Asian partners, non-black partners. Like I had a situation with this guy. He would contact me and, you know, express interest in me. And so I said, all right, well, let's go out on a date, which is already not really the way that I like to do things. Because usually I like for men to ask me out. And then he magically couldn't make it to the bar. He stood me up. This is the last time in my life, actually, I've ever been stood up. He had this complicated story. Somebody got sick. I was like, okay, whatever. It's probably bullshit. And then midnight comes around. Oh, you know, I'm free now. My friend's okay. Would it be okay if I came over and gave you a hug? It's very uncommon in the spaces that I'm in to see a black man who's in a relationship with a black woman um, in a way where that black woman is prioritized. The black men that I've been very interested in who have expressed interest in me often only have time for um, quick, short, sexual um, experiences. And not to say that there aren't a lot of you know men who aren't black who also feel that way, but I have a longer history of having long-term relationships with white men as a black woman, especially as a black trans woman, that you're just not going to ever be as valuable to um, a black man as even the most basic of a white woman, honestly. According to Newsweek, 43% of African-American women between the ages of 30 and 34 have never been married. Putting aside the fact that sometimes statistics can be misleading and polyamory is a thing, marriage is not the only indicator of a happy romantic life, as well as the fact that outside of the United States, most black people are marrying other black people. I'm in the Bahamas, where the status quo is pretty much a black person with another black person. But at the same time, black women are talking with one another and they're taking notes, sharing them as well on their grievances with black men. Black men are broke. They're violent. They don't take care of their kids. Black men don't have collectively a lot of wealth. You don't have a lot of wealth. They cheating. They uneducated. The list goes on. So an amalgamation of scorn due to the seeming refusal of black women from black men with the enduring criticism 
of black men from black women. And the fact that we now have social media as a grounds for people to come together, this has given the rise to the divestment community, which are typically, in short, black women encouraging other black women to date outside of their race. I watch a lot of that content. And, you know, a lot of it is kind of speaking directly to black women who are raised only to date black men who are told that dating outside of your race is, you know, the worst thing you could possibly do and encouraging them to widen their options, to not limit themselves to just black men. So frequently um, women are shamed out of making good choices for themselves. And sometimes um, some black women do need to hear that maybe a good choice for you is to widen your dating pool to include more than just black men. On the surface, this sounds like sound advice from black women to black women. And spaces where black women could speak to other black women about the issues that they face uniquely are extremely important. But what's also important is looking at the entirety of the context. Because there's an intersection where the divestment community and coon talk merge that is home to some very questionable takes. I, just because of my dating history, definitely think that the idea that white men are the solution um, is mislead. It's misled. You know, it's not true. I've had a lot of very tumultuous relationships with white men. And so I know that by virtue of them being white does not make them better partners. And I do think that in a lot of ways it does come off very white supremacist -y. I'm not going to list all kind of examples where white supremacy is pretty much being spot by black women in these spaces. Because I don't see what it's done to my elders and I like to learn from their mistakes. But it doesn't take long for you to stumble upon certain parts of the divestment community and see that they resemble white supremacist right-wing spaces. I don't know. This divestment thing makes, again, I said I'm going to say it a lot, but it makes me sad. Yeah. It makes me sad. You don't have to date a white guy. You don't have to seek, like, this high-value man. Like, it's <laughs> Michael McDoesn't exist. Like, you don't have to do that. I guess it makes me kind of sad, too, in the same way the Manosphere stuff makes me kind of sad. As easily as one could fall down the manholes of the Manosphere, you could also fall victim to right-wing rhetoric disguised as divestment. It starts with the tea channels, then it moves on to the black women and luxury channel that put forth a femininity prototype that did not have black people in mind when it was made. And black women have endured so much trauma from black men. The divestment community can seem like a way out of what can be a very tumultuous dating life. But the reality is, no relationship is the highlight reel that these divestment spaces show. It often is very uncomfortable and hard work, which can often be harder in interracial spaces. Partners, specifically in your own race, in terms of blackness and proximity, you guys could talk about things pertaining to white supremacy and really draw a lot of parallels, you know? And like, overall, it's just some things that you can't do in white spaces, which I was in my whole life. So just having a black girlfriend really kind of benefited me in that aspect, you know? That being said, the obstacles that mixed couples face are not insurmountable. And I believe the relationships like Brie and Jed are proof of concept, despite them disclaiming that they are not paragons of a perfect interracial relationship. George Floyd wasn't even the first time that we were in a relationship when someone black was murdered, you know, there was Tamir Rice, there was Trayvon, and I didn't really have too many black friends to talk about this stuff with. So, you know, I confided in you and then like, you learned. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be honest, I'll hold the L that I was like pretty ignorant on a lot of the context. I ain't gonna lie, I was surprised to hear Jed's level of accountability. No offense to Jed. Because many partners, I myself, struggle with accountability. And the type of accountability that he's accounting for is difficult. Not many people are trying to do that. And when I asked him how he forged that mindset, he claimed that his status as an immigrant in the United States 
helped him see Bree's point of view. For me, I felt like it was a lot easier for me to get there because it was a lot easier for me to sympathize with Brianna's experience as a black person in the United States and my experience as a first generation immigrant. Do you understand that like you benefit from a lot of things because your immigrant status is kind of like secret? Like when you walk into a room, you're just a white dude. But, a, they, but when they I hear you, the day walker, people don't know. <laughs> and I love that Brie feels safe enough to challenge Jed's transgressions in mixed company. That tells me that there's extensive work being had behind the scenes to the point where they're comfortable discussing what many of us would see as dirty laundry in a public video. And I appreciate how transparent they were about their conflicts. I'll just be transparent about one of the instances, like Zootopia had just came out. <laughs> okay, that's what you have to say. Man, I ruined this movie for Tariq when I first met him. <laughs> he was like, he that's, a, that's a good sidebar. Tell me how you didn't realize that them niggas was cops in Zootopia. I didn't really like that um, the Predators were basically a stand-in for minority people. Mm. And the message ultimately was just like, yeah, if you are uh, brown, just become a cop and everything will be better at the end. And that's what it felt like to me. Mm. And, then, and then you told me, you were like, I don't know, I think you're just kind of like... Like, why are you looking for something that's not even there? Like, you're just kind of making a big deal out of nothing. And then I got really offended. I was like, excuse me, what do you mean? And then I cried in the car. And then I was like, I can't, I was like, how, how am I supposed, I can't talk about these things with my boyfriend and you're making me feel bad about this. And then you were like, I'm so sorry. Oh, Jed, you're the sweetest fuck. You did so, the bare yeah. minimum and had common sense. Yeah, and that, that's- <laughs> Like, it's common sense that, that's to was- just be accepting and nice and not be a dick. That, that's what I was Absolutely. talking about because I was trying to figure out why it was so easy for, for me to do that kind of thing. And that's where a lot of the, the overlap of uh, like the immigrant community, yes. the first gen yeah. immigrant community and like the black community. If you watch these videos, then you know that cartoons and just entertainment. And the fact that Bree said that she's in a austerely white community where she doesn't have many black friends, her day to day is probably riddled with microaggressions. And home ought to be a refuge from the volatility of public discourse, which is why it's so important that Jed can be her peace while simultaneously working through his own biases. Because there are unique battles that interracial couples face, internally and externally. We've been together for a long enough time and we are now engaged. So any kind of semblance of it oh. being like a phase dude from the neighborhood that we're- High school students. That, that we're, we're now in high school. Um, I can't remember, like, we, we kind of, like, passed each other at the park. I ended up kind of talking for, like, a minute or two. And, like, he pretty candidly asked me, like, does, does it feel different? Does, like, a black woman feel different? And me being who I was, bro, I'm not even there. Why are you asking this of me? How am I supposed to? I don't even have reference. This is the type of things they got to deal with in person. People that you know. Meeting you with micro and macro aggressions. And then there's the genuine curiosity. But nothing comes closer than vitriol online from strangers you don't even know. Uh, honestly, I got like scared seeing both you and Feek talk about this because I was scared yeah. that it was going to be like cringe compilation of interracial couples and like just kind of going like, oh, look at those fucking weirdos over there. Yeah. And, and But at the same time, I trusted both of you because like I, like I was like afraid, but I also like had that trust of like... I enjoy the content of these two men and I know there will be nuance here. I, I love my black people and I love being black, but I do see a lot of like vitriol at mixed couples, mixed white and black couples by, uh, by uh, other black people. There are couples like us who are just trying to vibe and not really deal with all that bullshit. Black people that date monoracially, black people that date interracially, and interracial couples themselves are all victims of the affliction that is coon talk. And this is an endemic to the black and white dynamic. Because if you watch this video that I did with Olivia Sun, you know that a lot of the times when race is discussed, especially in the United States, 
They ain't talking about the rest of the spectrum. They talking about black and white. Cause this is the original boyfriend haul. I'm actually so glad you asked. Um, I purchased my husband at Asian Zeddy's RS. I got the six foot starter pack. Um, he came like this with his own set of chopsticks as well as a katana. We've hit a new height in clout chasing and I can't wait till shame becomes mainstream again. Cause this ain't the crate challenge or popping tide pods. This is a social media spit in the face of loving V Virginia. Pocahontas was more than a movie, you know. It was the first union between an interracial couple in 1614 in the United States. Soon as the Yanks catch wind of that, the law to ban interracial marriages was not long thereafter. And the idea of black men marrying white women was worse than the boogeyman for white American men before the Civil War. This rhetoric manifests itself in movies like Birth of a Nation and it still persists in people's minds to this day. But white men on the other hand, historically have consorted with black female slaves extramarily ad nauseum. So much so that they had a whole name for it. Children of the plantation, not children of the corn, children of the plants. Where black women would birth children for their white slave masters, but due to the one drop rule, they never were able to access whiteness. In fact, most times they were discarded by their white fathers. But don't forget now, black men, that's the deadbeats. Now when interracial marriages were legalized, the first to be married was a professor named William Allen and his student, Mary King. But y'all know that even though it's legal, it don't mean a thing to the Yanks them. You think they care? Willie barely escaped getting hung like a Christmas ornament. Even your boy Lincoln, you know the one that y'all be simping over over there in the States? I am not, nor ever have I been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. I as much as any man am in favor of the superior position assigned to the white race. This your old boy? This him here? Even long after interracial unions were legal, things were still pretty bad in the heartland. Listen, <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. Married Kim Novak, and this boy get more tomatoes and apple and lettuce throw at him than the cast of Veggie Tales. He was getting so much hate, so much flock, that he had to marry a whole black woman. You do the work for them. It's okay to like make jokes and stuff, like sure, whatever. But sometimes when it gets to be too loud and you end up sort of towing this weird line of doing the exact same thing that people on like the far right are doing they do, where yeah. they don't want where they don't want people to mix the group of people against race mixing are not progressive people they are the very people that malign minorities and are enemies of progress so i ask you who do you want to be associated with because i don't want to be associated with the nazis and that's why I had to account for my biases against interracial couples as well. And if you want to learn more about the dynamics discussed here, tap on any one of them videos and let them know the foreign censure. You are now watching The Nebula Cuts.